Yeah. What's up? Welcome to Journey in the Self. I'm your host, Sarah. We're doing our show in the aftermath of the Easter holiday. And um, Easter, of course, is a misnomer. It is a the celebration of Easter is actually a a pagan celebration of the uh, god Ishtar, which was a, uh, a deity that was known, uh, venerated for reproduction. And so uh, the celebration of Easter or Ishtar was a, a celebration of uh, reproduction and uh, the description of the, that that holiday uh, probably not suitable for children but the um, it was celebrated by engaging in the reproductive act uh, where um, the males would uh, seek out um, women who were nude and Painted, um, and they would hide, and um, that is the source of the Easter egg hunt. But the the holiday is uh, signifies the the sun passing over the equator, uh, thus the holiday or excuse me, the, um, the Passover uh, recognition is um, emanates from the sun passing over the equator on its path of the ecliptic, uh, signifying our movement into the spring, which is a time of rebirth and regeneration. So this time is, is symbolic of that. And is a time for us to be able to take the opportunity to uh, rebirth ourselves, reawaken into a new perspective of consciousness, a new awareness of who we are. Um, so it's appropriate that here on our journey in the self, we uh, talk about that um, opportunity for us to uh, to be reborn, if you will, and. Uh, begin our path to becoming um, a Christ or uh, harassed or uh, enlightened, you know, which are all uh, synonymous terms. Uh, Christ just means uh, uh, an anointed being or someone who has attained to the state of self-realization. And that is the, uh, the journey that we are all on whether we are aware of it or not, uh, that is the journey and purpose, primary purpose of our life. So I want to uh, acknowledge that and you know, also give uh, acknowledgement to the fact that this period of time that we're in is um, a very significant time. We're moving on the ascended path of the, of the great cycle and um, if we are aware of um, the different cycles that would be said in the, from the astrological standpoint, looking at the ages that we're uh, transitioning from the Piscean age into the Aquarian. And so we'll go into a, an age of uh, age of moving into enlightenment, the age of uh, knowledge, the age of gnosis, uh, the I know area, the age of information. So things that have been previously hidden are becoming revealed. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see a manifestation of that. We see how those uh, information is becoming more readily available to us, things that have been hidden in history uh, are starting to uh, to be identified. Um, 
then, you know, of course, some of these things uh, are creating a backlash uh, because there are those who have hidden the information uh, or those who have benefited or, um, or and those who have benefited from the hiding of the information um, are uncomfortable with it being revealed because they have been uh, comfortable in their delusion about what they thought history was. Okay. So a lot of things are, are manifesting as we uh, begin on that, the ascended path of the ecliptic in the uh, Indian in tradition, it, uh, we would be in the, the ascended part of the Japara Yuga, um, moving out of the Kali Yuga, which is the darkest period in the uh, in that cycle. Um, and so, you know, we've seen a manifestation of that and the the nature of the uh, the controlling forces uh, being dark because this is the uh, these are indeed uh, dark times. So I wanted to talk a little bit about things that are going on now in terms of the, the economic environment, the, uh, the banking situation, and some things that are starting to unfold on an international level. Um, in addition to the, the Resurrection Day uh, that we uh, celebrated over the past weekend. This day in particular marks the, the day that my brother, teacher, mentor, lecturer, uh, freedom fighter, You know, one of the, the most dedicated people that I've ever known, uh, had the pleasure to know, and, uh, you know, and also, you know, a hero of mine, uh, Brother Steve Coakley, uh, made his transition back in uh, 20, 2012. And so I wanted to, to also take the time to give honor and respect and pour our basis to our a good brother, Steve Coakley, uh, the most uh, uncompromising, uh, knowledgeable, uh, incomparable in terms of the quality of his research and the way he's documented the um, the enemies of our people and, and exposed uh, their plans to. Uh, subjugate us and to, uh, to be in power. Um, and so that's uh, all really valuable information for us to be aware of. And I do want to play a clip from Brother Steve. And I think the clip that I'm going to play is, uh, is very appropriate given the, the, the times and the current events that we've experienced, um, you know, particularly as it relates to um, what happened with Kanye West expressing the things that he expressed in terms of who controls Hollywood, which we, we addressed on a show earlier, uh, the situation in reaction to Kyrie Irving, who only just posted the a link to the movie from Hebrews to Negroes, uh, prompting a unrational uh, backlash against him uh, for only just posting the link without even opining on um, on the contents of it and uh, experiencing the uh, accusation, false accusation, I would say, of him being an, uh, an anti-Semite. So, but this is something that is, that is not new. Um, 
And the clip that I'm going to play is from Steve Coakley back in, I believe it was 1993, from a lecture called uh, Black and Jewish Relations, where uh, Brother Steve uh, talks about you know, some of the origins of the, the relationship that Black people in those, um, the Ashkenazi Jews who do make those accusations, um, talks about his own personal experiences uh, with that. Um, and of course, if you know anything about his journey, um, he ended up coming to, to prominence as a, uh, as a lecture, um, due to some lecturer, due to some backlash that he received in his hometown of Chicago when he was doing a lecture series at the Nation of Islam, um, amongst which he uh, talked about uh, who is behind controlling things in uh, the United States and uh, some key um, relationships that um, that they have had uh, with uh, black organizations. So I'm going to go ahead and play uh, some of that clip from Brother Steve Coakley. Uh, and, you know, for those who are not familiar with his work, uh, you'll get a, an opportunity to hear some of it. And I would encourage you to, if you have not, uh, expo been exposed to Brother Steve Coakley uh, to definitely avail yourself of the opportunity to go listen to his lectures, which you can readily find now on on YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and play um, some of that uh, lecture because we can't play it all because this one's a uh, very in-depth two-hour lecture. So with that, I'll just go ahead and play um, a clip from, from Brother Steve Coakley. Battery 90%. Connected to Sewer's iPhone. For the very concept uh, is a misnomer. Uh, we've been talking about this subject over really a of Black-Jewish relations for the very concept uh, is a misnomer. Uh, we've been talking about this subject over really a series of several lectures in a roundabout way. Uh, several nights ago, uh, we gave a lecture about the whites financing the new Negro. And we looked specifically at a period of time between 1910 and 1930 where the Jewish community was actively involved in creating a core of black leadership, which you became known as the Talented Tenth. And in fact, they had manipulated the leadership structure so strong that, had, that they had artificially created a cultural movement known as the Harlem Renaissance, which was organized distraction to deter away from the destruction of the Back to Africa program of Marcus Garvey. We've been talking about that the last couple of weeks. And many of you I know were here for those lectures. And you remember the importance or the essence of the dialogue was, was that when black Jewish relations first started, anytime you get in a devilogue with one of them, and the question of the facts surface, you tell them you know that there was no such thing as black Jewish relations before 1915. It was not until the Atlanta head of B'nai B'rith, Leo Frank, was hung for murder on the testimony of a black man did the Jewish community begin to infiltrate, penetrate, and appease the direction 
and the selection of black leadership. We proved that. And part of what it proves is it affirms that there has never, ever, ever been a beginning of a relationship where Jewish wealthy fall into an alliance with college-educated blacks because on the surface we understand that one has the money and the other must work for the money and no alliance of equality can start unequally. That is the beginning of the nightmare known as black fake Jewish relations. Because it's more than just how we relate but it's who we claim we are while we're relating. That's as important as what they claim they do or have done for us for so long. As you constantly hear them say, Cheney, Goodwin, and Schmoodwin, or somebody. And they start over again, three names. One of them was black. All three of them were stupid. They knew they were not supposed to leave the group. But you know how them white guys are. They believe that confronted with another white guy, they are all right. But that was not necessarily so. And so we understand that since the time of 1915, Jewish philanthropy, led by Julius Rosenwald, who was a part of the founding of Sears and Robux. Y'all got the cards in your pocket. I seen them. I seen you in Sears. I got pictures. I got the Marcus, you got the pictures. Brother Aston who got the pictures in the back. So we know it didn't make any difference that you could do business with co-op. You thought co-op mean cooperative. But the Rosenwalls looked at the danger of not infiltrating and demanding and controlling black leadership because Leo Frank was the first white man in the history of America ever convicted on the testimony of a black person. And that so scared them that the International Order of B'nai B'rith, the first chapter in 
to if we help them. And since our goal is to assimilate and be a part of this colonial experience, because we want one too, coming later in the 40s, check. See, if you assist a colonialist, he will assist you. Check. You'll pick up on that later. The, the state of is it real is a colonial experience, as is what you call America. So you assist a colonist, and he will assist you going to the U.N. and declaring this is a state, which is, in fact, occupied territory still. Now, so around the Reconstruction period, where Brother Man went forward and Brother Man got brought back, they say, oh, look, there's too many of them up there. Hey, stop. Oh, everybody, drop the, put everything down, start over. He'll do it again. He's doing it, right? Now he got, now he, they just even did the redistricting law the other day that now you can't discriminate against them. <laughs> the white woman in the back of the house getting 10% of the contract and a white man in the front getting the other 90. That's called minority set aside. <laughs> oh, man. The gays, a young white boy with his daddy running the world seeks additional rights. Ugh. Sign of no support system in the black community. Check. Now, this black Jewish, the fake black Jewish relations, saw that during the Reconstruction period, we understand that Jewish wealth, which can be documented in the book Our Proud by Stephen Bingham, went into the South and facilitated the trading of cotton from the shores of Louisiana and other spots to Britain and to France. So they did not stop the cotton slavery. They, in fact, were the merchants who benefited once it was bailed and prepared to be used by other whites in other cave lands without God bless resources, creator best bless resources. So subsequent to Reconstruction, where the word was, we cannot include any black man, not even a so-called free man. Around the turn of the 1900s, they began to recognize that they needed a few samples or models to show off to the others the so-called demonocracy system of the free world. And that involved building and developing a cadre of Negroes who could symbolically represent a class who was exploited, who based upon information trick trickery, white knowledge, use these Negroes as examples for all others that if you just behave, the American dream will work for you. And they began to develop or this starts the development of the making of the Negro. This making of the Negro was being prepared for black Jewish relations because there was no Negro to pair off with. So you couldn't have a black Jewish relationship if you didn't have a group of blacks who other blacks were told are the blacks to believe in. So they had to create an image that these were the blacks, and that all other blacks would give honor and tribute to these blacks who represent you in a dialogue of fake relations. We saw very carefully that Jewish philanthropy said we will help the Negro because he will help us. And we know that Julius Rosenwald said specifically, 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 Jewish Rosenwald said, by garnering and developing the leadership of the Negro, we will make ourselves useful to the other Anglophiles. You must understand that probably somebody chose cows, somebody chose pigs, somebody else chose niggas. And what leverage will you have with the big white man 
who had just cleaned out our original brothers who were here before he got here. Keeping all of these things in context, we understand that we have never had any relationship with any whites in this land that have ever resembled equality. We understand that. So in that consideration, any dialogue over what we were is never, we were never starting in the same spot. And so much, I can, will show you many articles and other things with Henry Louis Gates, Chuck Negro, at, where is he at? Harvard, I mean Harvard, at Harvard and Cornell West. A Negro who has a book out on race relations that says absolutely nothing. But they're going to pay to create him an image to give him authority to say negative things about black Jewish relations. I confronted him in Washington, D.C. recently where he was lecturing at Howard University and happened to be walking past Crampton Auditorium and the student said, Man, Cornell West is downstairs. We asked him, what did he think of Steve Coakley? And he said, you know, at Coakley, you know, he talk a lot of stuff. He don't back none of his stuff up, you know, all that old uh, militant dialogue. So they ran right upstairs and got Coakley. I brought Coakley downstairs. So Coakley said, hey, you, you mentioned my name? And he stepped back and said, oh, no, brother, I, I didn't even know. I, I, brother, I didn't have nothing to say about you. I, uh, I said, okay, brother, I just wanted to make sure that you could have the opportunity to say it right to Coakley. Because you probably didn't know he was around, like right upstairs. And so when my friends say they asked you earlier and you sort of said you said something about me, but I'm glad you're telling me that you didn't say that because I'm here to have addressed you for what they said you said. <laughs> but since you didn't say it, I guess I ain't got to take it to you. It's a pleasure to meet you, brother. Here's my phone number in case you get the urge to speak about me. <laughs> but you know I will hold you responsible for calling me first so that you can address me. I mean, I, I've been uh, condemned by Paul Robeson, Jr., on the black Jewish relations. They got that nigga out there flunking for it. They got uh, Roy Innocent's son out there on the Jerry Springer show ringing my name up flunking for black Jewish relations. Well, they gone and got the sons of the sons. <laughs> Sister, did you want to sit down? You need a chair? Yes, you want to sit down? Okay, when you need to sit down, say you need a chair. So Brother Fitzgerald right there, make sure you get one. Check. So, um, Paul Robeson Jr. condemned me on black Jewish relations, and he was in Washington recently, and I called him up on the radio. In fact, I got the little sound bite up here. I said, oh, brother, I hear you was talking about that guy, Steve Coakley. He said, oh, yeah, he's anti-Semite. Uh, I've read some of his works, and so I ain't real shit, right? <laughs> I read some of his works. It's definitely anti-Semite. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, we really need to stand up against this anti-Jewish dialogue. I said, well, brother, I am Steve Coakley. <laughs> and uh, I would like to know which of those uh, tapes, or uh, since then, I didn't write nothing, uh, did you hear? Uh, because I'd like to address it specifically. Because I heard you earlier say how the white people had condemned your father and labeled him things of which you say he was not. And I'm calling you to say that I want you to give me the respect that you're asking for for your father. Because I claim I deserve it like you believe he does. Check on that. So when he comes nearby, you ask him because he'll be there to tell you he couldn't tell me what he heard. He said he got some tapes from a friend. He couldn't tell me which friend or what it was. And that's when you know an idea has been planted that you're to attack a person under the guise of fake black Jewish relations. I remember being right here in Los Angeles and having a sister who was the uh, student government head at USC, University of Southern California, right here who wanted me to speak at her school. But because it had been alleged around different spots that the Jewish community comes out and attacks me, she was told by a person who I thought was my friend that you should not have Steve Coakley at your school 
Because if you do, the Jewish people will ruin your career. Now, in fact, I have not found a black person who had a career with white people. So I said, I don't know what could be taken away, seeing ain't nothing being given. See, uh, a rebellion or two, a lot of things develop. Uh, no action, no, 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 no throwdown. So I know ain't nothing even dropping down off of the off of the stolen tree. So he put fear into this system. Not for what had ever happened, but for what he felt would happen to her. And he says this is love for her. What happens when a black student union can't get a black man to talk black to speak in the context for which they were organized? And Ralph Williams was my friend. He used to be a member of African Minds United. And in fact, I always thought that the one who spreads the fear is as guilty of perpetrating the negativity as the one who allegedly does it. As long as I've been involved in so-called hate activity thrown at me from Jewish people, one thing that is unanimous, they ain't never got in my fucking face with that shit. Excuse my language, huh? Sorry for the violation. But see, black, fake black Jewish relations goes deep, deep in my soul. Because a lot of people have been scared away from me as a result of it, so I bear a lot of pain when I talk about it. That's why I ain't even holding nothing in my hand. I don't need to because it's deep in my soul. And I made a point of saying that when I was attacked and fired, from the mayor's office in Chicago, I didn't know anything about Jewish people other than about Rothschild. See, when I talk about the Jewish community, I talk about, my job is to talk about the heads of the opposition. Now, I'm a, I'm a linebacker, and uh, I want to tackle the one with the ball on the opposition, and it looks like to me the quarterback has it more than most. So I'm kind of focused at trying to get who's commanding the opposition. We already got a squad up there watching the owners, another squad watching the stockholders. Now we're going to take the ball. And so I always looked at Rothschild as the titular head of the Jewish community, and anything any of the other ones did, it was only because he said so. So when you go to talk about the devil off with them over Jewish relations, you say, let me start with Baron de Rothschild. He ain't even the first generation of the granddaddy Rothschild, but he's just manifest in the late 1800s in England, who shows up on the docket of Assistant Cecil Rhodes to colonize Azania. So we start there with the top daddy manifesting of the Jewish community, Rothschild. Rothschild wanted to assist Cecil Rhodes in amalgamating the gold and diamonds in South Africa because Cecil Rhodes could give him something that he wanted. There was a Jewish guy there in South Africa named Bernie Bonato. He was the number one competitor to Cecil Rhodes for eating up and buying all of the wealth of the diamonds and the gold. A Jewish man named Alfred Beck took Rhodes to England and met him with Rothschild, and there Rothschild decided to help the Anglo and not the Jewish man. Why did he not help the other Jewish guy and side with Cecil Rhodes? Because the other Jewish guy, Bernie Bonato, had no power in England. And because he had no power in England, if Rhodes, if Rothschild assisted him, all he would have was more money. He needed something that money couldn't buy. He needed to start a state. And he needed a state because the people who were claiming that they were waiting for a Messiah had a meeting one day yeah. and said, you know, said, man, by what year, Rabbi, do you think that the Messiah is going to come and lead us to the promised land? You know, wherever we're supposed to go, it's the Messiah who's supposed to lead us there. He said, well, you know, I need to sit you down, my great great-great-grandson and tell you the story 
about how you got in this position. The story starts way up in the Caucasian mountains where we met with some people on the other side who taught us a story about the chosen people. We mimicked the story, but the story really wasn't about us. It was about them. So we came down the hill and repeated the story to the people who would hear it. And as long as the real one didn't come across the mountain, no one ever knew the difference. In fact, we were known then as the Khazarians. He said, son, there's no Messiah going to come free us. That movie Exodus and all that other stuff, all that, that Charlton Heston and all that, <laughs> said, we lied, son. Son of son of son. And son says, Rabbi, what are we going to do? Rabbi says, well, we're going to shift our strategy, and we're going to no longer wait on the Messiah. We're going to go out and get some of these damn politicians to recognize us as the chosen people. You just hold on. Our man Rothschild got a deal working with Rhodes where he's going to get his buddy Lord Balfour to declare that the British government would not look unfavorably upon us founding, finding, founding, finding a state in a land where people already live. <laughs> I'm going to leave that clip there and I will encourage you to go to YouTube and listen to that lecture for yourself. I highly encourage you doing so because that one is highly informative and will place some context around the nature of the reaction to Kanye West, to Kyrie Irving or anyone else who, uh, Marcus Cannon, uh, or anyone else who would bring up uh, any issues pertaining to the Jewish people. And uh, anyone who's been accused of being an anti-Semite, you will understand uh, the nature of that reaction and the context of it. So I highly encourage you to uh, to listen to that and to also um, get the books that Brother Steve Coakley recommends. But I wanted to do that in honor of our brother and to just show uh, the brilliance that he displayed in terms of his analysis of the of what we've had to, to, to battle what we've had to face uh, throughout our history, um, how our organizations have been co-opted and manipulated and leaders so-called chosen for us uh, to not lead us, but to, to control us on behalf of, of the elite. So, I pour a libation to our, our brother Steve Coakley. Ashe. 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 So, in honor of brother Steve, I want to take the opportunity to discuss a little bit further about uh, what I have observed in terms of uh, the current environment, the economic environment, what's going down in the banking realm and uh, the media and how it's handling its coverage over events that have unfolded in banking. As I pointed out on our last show, the, the bank closures in and of themselves are not indicative of a larger banking crisis. I pointed out how the closure of those banks, particularly the closure of Silicon Valley Bank, was a 
primary example of uh, poor risk management, poor management. Um, and if you um, you want to hear that show, um, you know, just reach out for uh, the recording of that show. But I gave a pretty detailed analysis of, of what happened with, with with that banking institution. But That situation is not indicative, again, of the condition of, of the banking industry. Even in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, because of the, the assistance that was given to, to businesses, uh, primarily the uh, payroll protection program, uh, the PPP loans, which were um, provided to keep businesses um, basically afloat uh, during the crisis. Um, those actually was effective. Those loans were effective in, in averting uh, a deep, deeper economic crisis uh, such that um, as would have been expected during such a long period where there was minimal economic activity uh, that it would have been expected that uh, loans would have uh, defaulted, um, particularly business loans. But because of the the economic aid that was offered uh, to individuals and businesses, that didn't happen. So consequently, uh, the banks ended up being in pretty good shape and many people, uh, despite the low interest rates, uh, continue to keep their money in banks. Okay, and so uh, banks actually ended up having more money on hand than they had anything to do with it. So, uh, banks more, had more than enough money to lend. Um, most banks were you know, pretty well capitalized, and uh, their their loan portfolio was a was a good quality, and and that continues to be the case now. Typically, when when interest rates rise, uh, banks tend to do better, at least in the in the short term, because most of the commercial banks uh, and commercial or banks that that lend primarily to business, commercial bank loans are typically um, adjustable rates. So as rates increase, the, the income that the, that the banks make increases because the, the borrowers are having to pay, um, make higher payments because the, because the rate increase. Okay. Now, the first point that I want to make is that Again, the, the condition of the bank as a whole and in the industry has been sound. Now, and again, I pointed out that this, this was just a, the banks that failed were, were primarily due to poor management. Yet, despite that, the media has depicted it as a larger uh, banking crisis, which I alluded to last time, which is somewhat curious in that it's typical that the media tends to downplay any fears of uh, 
in particular in banking, um, they tend to, 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 to downplay um, even, you know, from an overall economic standpoint, they tend to be reluctant to even, you know, acknowledge or say uh, the word recession. So I found it quite curious that the the media, instead of downplaying the circumstances that were occurring in, in the banking industry, instead they seem to be stoking fear um, by making it seem or appear to be more significant than it actually was. Okay, now the effect of that is that by creating a public perception, a negative public perception of the state of, of the banking industry, um, that would in turn create the very thing that, uh, that they're reporting on. So it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the coverage itself is likely and has begun uh, to create uh, problems in, in banking because of the, the fear that it has uh, invoked in, in the populace such that uh, people have started uh, moving their money out of smaller institutions into uh, larger institutions which they perceive to be more safe. Which, as I bring that up, seems to be the, the game, the objective, the goal. Because, and, and here's another uh, thing in terms of going back and listening to Brother Steve Copley's tapes that when you listen to his tapes about the, um, where he talks about uh, the Rothschilds that he mentioned there on, on the, the clip that I just played, uh, he talks about the extent to which they've come to control the central banks all over Europe and also here in America uh, through the Federal Reserve. And it was uh, Rothschild, Rothschild's agent, Paul Warburg, who put forth the, uh, the Federal Reserve Act legislation that brought the Federal Reserve into um, existence here in this country. But prior to that, people, the people in the country had become all too aware of how the economy was being ma manipulated in such a way that uh, there would be cycles where there would be an economic downturn, a significant economic downturn, which would end up uh, facilitating a, a, a great transfer of wealth, right, where um, the big banks, the money center banks, um, the elite institutions, but investment banks included, would always uh, benefit and grow by, amongst other things, um, absorbing institutions that fail and then, um, and then they would grow bigger and more successful. And so uh, the people had become aware uh, that the economic panics were being uh, manipulated by these by these banks, and so um, the sentiment was to create uh, regulations and to um, to remove the 
the power of the large money center banking institutions um, such that they would not be able to continue to do so. Uh, however, you know, there was uh, people were deceived into believing that that's what they were achieving um, and uh, that manipulation ended up leading to the creation of the Federal Reserve, which basically consolidated uh, the power amongst the um, money center banks because the Federal Reserve is essentially owned by those same institutions. Okay, so that's another uh, homework assignment uh, for those who are so inclined to learn more about the um, the nature of the, the banking system and who controls it. Okay, and, um, and this knowledge I ended up gaining from, from Brother Steve. Okay, so, but to my point, the, if again, you follow the work of Brother Steve Coakley, he, he identifies the, the linkages between the large banking institutions, the money center banking institutions and uh, various um, other businesses, which include uh, the media. And um, during one of my earlier shows, you know, we pointed out uh, who is in control of the major media. And, you know, so you see, you know, that Brother Steve documents the interlinking uh, directorships, the interlinking shareholders of the major corporations, banking corporations and uh, non-banking corporations, including the media. And so then you see the, the, the thread that binds them, you know, that connects those things. And so, um, so there's no coincidence that the media would portray the banking industry in the way that it did you know, which when, I, when it was occurring, I was saying it was curious that it was being covered that way because typically the, the media tends to downplay concerns in order to be able to uh, avoid eroding consumer confidence. Okay, but instead they've done the opposite. So my analysis is that the reason that they instead seem to be stoking the fear is to create fear which would trigger a response to have consumers move their money from the smaller institutions into the larger institutions which would um, create failure of those smaller institutions and allow the bigger banks to basically uh, acquire their assets at a discounted price. Okay, so the ultimate game seems to be uh, consolidation in, um, in banking. You know, so that seems to be the objective, that's my analysis of the way of, of what's actually occurring right now. Okay. And so while my analysis was that uh, there, there, from a financial standpoint, there is no uh, banking crisis, but it can be created by the way, and it seems to be in the, in the process of being created uh, artificially through the manipulation of, um, of the media. Okay. Now, what I was about to say as well is that um, one of the 
one of the, um, I guess, what's the word, uh, the results or um, a um, an adverse uh, effect of raising interest rates is that although banks would benefit from increasing interest rates because they would make more money on the loans, uh, that assumes that the bank's borrowers have the capacity to be able to to withstand the interest rate increases and be able to pay uh, higher payments that result from the higher higher rates. And so there there becomes a point when when borrowers uh, cash flow is not sufficient to be able to uh, make those higher payment requirements. And that's when you start to see deterioration in the banks is when the borrowers are not able to repay the loans at the higher rates, then that's when you begin to start to see some um, loan problems start to manifest in the banks, uh, which in turn uh, requires banks to, uh, to put up more money uh, in case loans go bad, which then in turn starts to uh, uh, cut into their their earnings performance and also uh, cut into their their capital position. Okay, and so um, I do foresee as a result a, a significant economic downturn. There will end up being um, a banking crisis, um, but it will have been precipitated initially by uh, the decline in liquidity resulting from uh, consumers moving their money from smaller banking institutions to larger banking institutions and um, ultimately when uh, borrowers are, are unable to continue to make uh, the higher interest payments uh, that's going to end up starting to um, uh, erode the quality of the uh, of bank loans um, that will in turn um, you know, in fact uh, as I'm saying this there's been reports of um, large companies uh, laying off right now uh, there was a large uh, layoff announced by McDonald's of all places Many uh, other companies have been have been laying off, and um, I would suggest that that's a direct response to the to the increasing uh, interest rate environment uh, that has occurred since the Fed has been raising rates to uh, to try to combat inflation. Um, so. Um, banks are now seeking to, to be able to cut expenses in order to be able to offset the effect of the uh, the increase in interest expense that they're forced to pay. Um, so, again, I do foresee a um, an economic downturn, recession, depression, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. You'll never hear an economist use that word, uh, depression. But... Um, I do see that uh, happening for a number of reasons. Um, so the, the reasons that I just gave you, um, but also, um, as I pointed out, with the significant increase in the money supply that the uh, that the Federal Reserve has created over the past uh, 25 years or more, um, it is inevitable for the the value of the dollar uh, to decline uh, significantly as it has, and that's why there is inflation. Um, it's not that so much that the uh, prices of the goods in and of themselves have gone up, but it's the the value of the dollar has declined relative to uh, the value of the goods. Um, so. You know, be prepared for 
you know, for that and, and, and be mindful of making uh, making plans. This will be a time when it's going to be uh, particularly important for um, for black people to be more unified because it's going to be necessary for us to be able to help each other through uh, the times that we're going to be faced in, faced with. Um, you know, the other thing that's happening is that uh, with um, these BRICS company uh, negotiations, country rather, BRICS country negotiations, uh, it appears that the uh, that there are companies who are, or excuse me, countries, countries who are looking to move to a different currency for oil and other international transactions. And uh, if that were to occur and be successful, um, that would have an extremely adverse effect on uh, the United States and the dollar, because the the primary thing that's holding up the value right now internationally is the fact that it is used as the primary means of international trade and is the uh, medium of medium of exchange for oil transactions. So, um, so be mindful of that um, and keep a close watch on. On what unfolds there, and um, you know, and I'll, I'll be doing the same thing and um, and sharing my perspective on it. Okay, so those are the things that I wanted to uh, to discuss. There's there's more that I could go into uh, now, but I will say that for uh, for the next show, um, we'll go into that uh, a little bit more uh, in depth. Um, you know, particularly as it uh, pertains to the economic front. And then, you know, we'll talk about some things that, you know, we can do to help to be able to um, manage ourselves as we go, go through this period of uh, transformation. Okay, so uh, with that, um, I hope you found this to be uh, informative, and I do again uh, encourage you to um, to go to YouTube and uh, listen to Steve Coakley lectures, and better yet, I encourage you to uh, to visit uh, Brother Steve Coakley Jr.'s website, The Moringa Matrix. Uh, I think it's Mer MoringaMatrix.com where uh, Brother Steve Coakley Jr. Uh, sells his father's uh, videos and, um, and audios. And, uh, and I would encourage you to also support him um, by purchasing his, uh, his health products. His, uh, health is important as well. Uh, so I do support Brother Steve Coakley Jr. And uh, avail yourself of the uh, lectures of uh, Brother Steve Coakley, Sr., um, my friend and teacher. So with that, uh, I thank you for, for listening. Uh, do also reach out to me if you find yourself in need of counsel or know someone who is in need of counsel. Uh, refer them to me. And you can reach me on, uh, on Facebook or by my website, www.sa-ra.org. So with that, I thank you for, for listening, and we'll see you next time here on Journey in the South. Hotel.